Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sara Urtarte. I am the co-executive director at Ceres, and I'm the moderator for today's session. Um, today we're having Diego Mendez, um, and I'll do a brief introduction of Diego. Diego is executive director and founder of Learner, um, a consultancy company dedicated to improve learning processes in social and educational organizations. He also works as a consultant and speaker for national and international organizations like the International Youth Foundation, United Way, and also as university professor in the University of Santiago in Chile. He has specializations in public policies, social psychology in childhood and youth, group management, among other topics. Diego's topic today is resilience and positive youth development in a post-pandemic scenario. He's going to be talking about the comparative analysis regarding promoting resilience in the educative system in Latin America. Um, and we'll do a review of different experiences in the Latin America educational systems and analyze the successful projects that can inspire changes in the teaching of resilience and positive youth development throughout the continent. So, oh, Diego, um, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you here uh, today. Um, and yes, we can start off if you, if you want to start having a hello and then you're off with your presentation. Thank you very much, Sarah. I want to say thank you to everyone at Amarna, especially Estrella, Liliana, uh, and of course yourself. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk about resilience. Uh, I would like to start actually setting a frame in, through which we can, we can understand resilience in a different way. We will talk about how we can change our view of, of resilience, how we can actually change the glasses that we use to understand this concept. And uh, also, we will talk later about uh, how the educational systems can uh, provide and actually do provide um, a resilience framework in terms of developing certain skills that lead to the uh, development of more resilient persons. We will look at how the different interventions, how the different projects and programs actually intervene how what are the glasses what are the paradigms that they are actually uh, using when they uh when they implement projects that actually try to uh, improve resilience in people and uh, so as as i was saying let me just change the slide there we go we will start by talking of, about what is resilient. And the reason that, why are we doing this? Why are we talking about what is resilience? Basically because there, there's still certain confusion and certain disagreement regarding of what is, what is resilience and how useful it is in terms of social interventions. Um, there's even authors that state that we, should, we shouldn't be talking about resilience uh, because resilience can be a result of the development of, of the development of certain social skills. Um, so this is a controversy that we need to address, and we'll start by that. Um, we'll start by by trying to change the way that we are understanding resilience. We will talk later about uh, this comparative analysis uh, of what we are doing in terms of. Um, resilient programs in terms of programs that actually seek to improve resilience in a community or in a school, for instance. And uh, we'll conclude with a small conversation about the post-pandemic scenario. We know that COVID-19 has set uh, different difficulties, different um, different. Um, it has has different impacts on the educational systems of Latin America, and we need to address that. And, and we will talk briefly about what's the scenario in in that sense. So let's let's see first something that is really interesting that and that it's related with the fact that resilient has and 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 I'm sorry on on the other side. Abusement and maltreatment, uh, uh, it, it does has an impact on uh, every person that suffers it. Um, 
So what we are looking right now in our screen, it's uh, an image of uh, two brains, two different brains. Uh, the one on the left uh, has no signs of abuse. And the one on the right, on the other hand, is uh, showing us the impact of abuse and maltreatment in um, our uh, brain architecture. Why are we looking at this? First, because we need to understand that vulnerability, mal maltreatment, abuse um, does produce certain effects in ourselves, especially in the way that our brain uh, builds itself. Uh, and in that sense, what we can see through the images and the evidence is that persons, uh, people that have suffered from difficult moments in their lives, that have suffered pain due to uh, family problems, uh, social vulnerability problems, um, social abuse, um, these types of situations generate different effects on people's cortical uh, connections, on people, uh, people's brain architecture. And in that sense, what we can see is that the brain of the people that have suffered from maltreatment tends to be more connected in the right percunius and in the uh, insula and less connected in the singulus. Uh, in the left singulars. What does this mean? It means that people ha that have suffered from maltreatment tends to have uh, a different way of dealing with difficulties, tends to be more impulsive in terms of decision making, and um, the areas that are related with emotional regulations tend to have a different structure than a different structure uh, if we compare it with people that hasn't suffered all of that. So why we should see this, why, what we can conclude about this information is that vulnerability, abuse and maltreatment has an impact on the way that our brains are built. And that, of course, it's related to the way that we behave and we um, relate to each other in a community. Now, I'm not here trying to state uh, that everything happens in the brain uh, because it doesn't. Uh, actually, most of things, uh, what we are seeing is the effects of something that happens in the environment. So it's not like if we change someone's brain, we're going to build more resilience. That's not the case that I'm, that I'm, I'm putting here. What we are actually saying is that if we change the environment, then maybe we can achieve certain results that help people to become more happy or more um, to actually build uh, a personal development accordingly to its expectations. And this is important because for many years we have seen resilience as something that may not be such, that may be a little bit different as the way that we are understanding understanding it right now. What do I want, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying with this is the following. We have looked at resilience through three main glasses, uh, to three main lenses. Uh, and I'd like to use this metaphor to, to speak about paradigms. Paradigms are the way that we see the world. And, and when we see the world in a certain way, we live outside of it outside of the things that we see, many other things that can actually explain a phenomenon. In that sense, we have looked at resilience through three main paradigms. Most of them comes from our understanding. We have to know, we have to acknowledge that resilience is not a social science concept. It's a concept that comes from engineering and it relates with the endurance of materials when they are uh, put to a certain amount of stress. Uh, when we when we actually uh, apply force to a metal, for instance, that metal can uh, actually change its form to endure the the pressure of that 
and the amount of energy that it's produced, it's what engineers will call resilience. That concept was brought brought to social sciences, um, not in a properly scientific way. And that's why we, we have so many problems measuring resilience right now. That's why we don't know today if resilience is the independent or the dependent variable in our studies. And this is really important because when we design projects and interventions, what we are doing is that we are dealing with, we are providing a framework that states that if we change uh, X, that will have an impact on Y. Uh, if we change this, we will have an impact on this other issue. And if uh, and if we don't have a clear understanding, uh, understanding, understanding, I'm sorry, of what resilient is, then uh, the consequence of that is that our projects will lack the scientific um, quality needed to actually intervene in a certain population. So we are, we are understanding today resilience through three lenses. The first one is the individual one. And what we're saying with this is that authors and publications that take, that embrace this paradigm tends to, tends to put resilience or tends to define resilience as the ability to overcome adversity to adapt yourself and recover uh, to actually achieve a more productive or a more meaning, meaningful life. And this is uh, the classic paradigm. And uh, what we are going to see later when we look at what is going on right now in Latin America in terms of interventions, most interventions use this paradigm. The following one is the environmental paradigm. And in that sense, the authors and the investigations that uh, adopt, that embrace this paradigm, <clears throat> state that the, what, should, what we should be looking is what's, what's going on around the person uh, in terms of the community, the schools, the jobs, the factories, um, the neighborhood, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so, what they do is actually they try to intervene, they try to change that the environment of uh, people in order to uh, improve uh, resilience in a given context. And the third one, the third paradigm, it's called uh, interactionist, uh, basically because what they are saying is that we should look at both things. We should look at what's going on in the environment and what's going on with the person itself. And this is really interesting because it's a more comprehensive um, and, of course, more difficult to measure uh, paradigm. Uh, it's hard to see how interactions in, 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 a, in a scientific way, no? it's, it ha it's hard to see uh, how they actually relate. We, we have now built more complex models in terms of uh, a statistical analysis that allow us to understand better how uh, these two things relate, but we need to continue working to understand actually the full extent of this um, of this uh, interaction, of this relationship between the person and its environment in order to uh, conclude what actually promotes better uh, resilience in that sense. And I, I like to use an example to, to close this idea, to actually understand better this idea about uh, the three paradigms uh, regarding resilience. And uh, I usually use this question, you know, if if we have a person, imagine yourself, you're living alone in an island. Uh, there's a movie about this. Of course, you, you all know it. It's uh, the Tom Hanks movie called, uh, I think, uh, I, I know the Spanish name. It's called El Naufrago. I, I don't remember the English name. Uh, but of course, okay, let's go back to the example. We have a person that it's alone in an island. Uh, and I usually ask people if this person is resilient or not and what people usually, and I'm pretty sure that everyone that's listened, listening to this talk right now, to this uh, conference will say, well, of course, if that person lives in an island and he's alone and he's surviving, that person is the ultimate example of resilience. And in that sense, my conclusion actually is that no, 
We cannot know if that person is resilient until it knows, until it's confronted with another person that actually acknowledge the fact that that person living in an island is resilient. And I, I know this sounds complicated, but I'm going to explain this right now. Why we have to achieve, why, why we have to conclude that this person living in an island is not resilient? Because the minimum unit of analysis of human beings is the bond is the relationship between two persons. Uh, we as human beings are social, uh, as uh, we are social in terms of um, our, our understanding of ourselves um, requires uh, at least two persons to actually compare, to actually acknowledge that the other is different than me. And this is a really important point in social sciences because Uh, it sets it sets the the paradigm that we should use in terms of uh, in terms of understanding resilience. When we are saying that the minimum unit of analysis of human beings is the bond, we are saying that in order to understand resilience, we need to understand that as a social concept, as a concept that relates people and, and that it's related to the way that that people survive or actually improve itself uh, or generate itself the minimum conditions for a better living. Uh, so as I was saying, we can no longer continue to understand resilience as an individual competence of people. We should look at it, look at it in terms of social um, of social paradigm. Uh, we have wrongfully learned that resilience is a personal competence based and associated with a merit, which is a myth, and we are going to talk about that right now, uh, because we never talk about those who fell by the wayside. And I'm using this... Uh, I, I, I expect that I don't shock people with that Frying Nemo image, um, but I'm, I'm using it just to put an example of this. Uh, we probably we won't have seen a movie in which Nemo ends up fried, right? Um, and this is not a minor issue. This is not a, a minimal thing if we... Take, if, if we extrapolate it, if we take it into uh, the real life. When we talk about resilience, we talk about the persons who, who did. Usually we, when, we under, when, we, when we go to conference, when we go to talks about resilience, there is this guy or this woman, there is a person that has overcome many difficulties in their lives and they're now successful and they achieve things and uh, they have a better life built for themselves. But what happens to the people that fall uh, that fall by the wayside, the people that actually fought and maybe didn't achieve what we are understanding as success? Um, when we look, for instance, when we looked at the uh, educational studies, evidence show us that there is no as there, there isn't really a strong connection between resilience and academic success. Not necessarily someone who is resilient is going to have better grades, basically. Um, why does this happen? Because maybe we should start questioning what we are understanding as success in our lives, in our model, in our economical, economic system. Um, we have built a uh, definition of resilience that it's based on the idea that if you work hard if you work really really hard you're going to achieve to uh, you're going to be successful in life and what we are seeing right now in terms of the evidence provided by different countries regarding the ability of the capacity of people to actually uh, change their their environment or change themselves is that people with Better income tends to be more successful because they are they have the networks, they have the money, they have the the, the social structure that can provide for that for that success. So this is interesting because maybe and this is why we shouldn't understand resilience as an individual competence because it puts us once again in this idea of merit of the of things 
uh, of things that we achieve based only on, on our effort. And we forget about the fact that there are many barriers, there are many um, difficulties put by the system itself to people to actually uh, build a better life for themselves. Let's take an example. Uh, I'm going to use a local, uh, uh, an, uh, a Chilean situation, a Chilean conflict to put a, uh, an example of this situation. Mapuche people have been fighting against first the Spanish people and then the Chilean people for about 500 years. You cannot conclude that they are not resilient. Actually, the fact is that if they have survived for 500 years, they have to be resilient. They are resilient. Uh, they are resilient as a community, uh, and of course, we can congratulate ourselves and say, "Yeah, the Mapuche people are actually uh, really resilient. This is a great example of resilience." Uh, but if we don't address the fact that ch the Chilean state is killing Mapuche people, then we're not solving the problem. That's why we need to understand resilience as as, as a matter of. of of social uh, intervention and as a matter of the way that we are building our economical and political and social uh, system uh, because resilience can be a really uh, danger, really dangerous concept if we accept it as only, only as the, the ability to endure and to accept the conditions of the conditions of the system without changing it. If we looked at, res at resilience, if we look at resilience only as a concept to describe acceptance and conformity, then we are making a terrible mistake. Um, if we look at resistance as a way to describe accept, acceptance and conformity with the system and its conditions, that w then we're doing a terrible uh, mistake in terms of what we can actually achieve, what, what's the purpose of resilience itself. Resilience should be understood as, um, as the fight for a, for a different future in that sense. And th this has tremendous implications in terms of the interventions because it changes the way that we propose and the way that we uh, work with people when we understand these uh, conditions. Resilience is social. I'm not going to talk more about this idea because I think that I've, I've done it quite enough. Um, all human beings are resilient in that sense. That's why we cannot, uh, once again, that's why we cannot understand resilience as something that is uh, unique to one person. We are resilient basically because we live. Living is an act of resilience. Um, it, of course, it's relative, to, it's relative to the context in which we analyze the behavior. I just put three images there that that sets that, that sets the example that, that we can use as an example of that. The first one is Auschwitz in Poland, and of course we have there an example of resilience. Um, the second one is the picture of a Chilean person after the 2010 earthquake. Uh, and and uh, we, as you know, we are a, a country that. Uh, live and, and goes through uh, earthquakes quite often. <laughs> We're quite used to them. And it, it's really impressive to see how the community organizes itself and overcomes the difficulties set by the environment. And of course, uh, the third picture is about uh, COVID-19 and how all society, all society, the whole world right now is acting in a resilient way by dealing with the epidemic, with the pandemic that we're facing uh, as, a, as, a, as a community. So I'm going to change a little bit uh, about our topic. I'm going to talk about how investigations and, and projects in Latin America deal with, um, with resilience, how they understand resilience. And what we did is that our team actually did a meta-analysis of cases and investigations in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm not going to go through every detail of that investigation. I'm just going to jump straight ahead to the conclusions of that. Um, but what we did actually was to look at hundreds of papers, hundreds of uh, uh, projects, and to identify four things. 
what is the paradigm that they they're, that they are using what's what are their objectives and their target population what strategies do they use and what results are they achieving we look at these four things and we compare it and uh, we um, later build Uh, a diagnosis of uh, these interventions in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the first conclusions that the first conclusion that we can achieve uh, is that the paradigm that it's used today in uh, Latin American investigations and interventions regarding resilience, it's still based on the premise of individual competence. Most of the investigations that we looked at uh, stated that resilience was something that it belongs to the individual itself. Um, and therefore, their intervention was, okay, let's try to build resilience. This is curious because, uh, and this is quite uh, funny because when you look at the intervention itself, when, <clears throat> when you look at the strategy that they use, most of the interventions do not intervene on the person itself. They intervene on the system. So that's a contradictory um, approach. And, and this happens in many, many research and in many, many uh, projects in, uh, in Latin America. Um, the second conclusion, the second uh, Uh, the second aspect that we, we, we saw on these studies is that usually target population tends to be teachers. Um, this is th th what they use is a methodology, it's a strategy called train the trainer. So you basic, basically train the, the teacher to teach resilience to kids and you have different strategies for that from artistic uh, artistic uh, activities to actually promote creativity and through creativity develop resilience uh, once again we find that uh, when we are talk about when we are talking about resilience um, investigations and projects tend to uh, develop social skills to achieve it So uh, what we're seeing in that sense is that uh, resilience is stated as a dependent variable, as a result. Um, for instance, when we when we look about um, when we look at the educational interventions in to, to actually promote resilience, what they do, what they tend to do is uh, enrichment of the bond. Th that means that we can that, that they promote better relations between uh, the students and the teachers and the students and the students and its community. Um, they set, uh, uh, they provide uh, support and caring. They <clears throat> establish and, and communicate higher expectations about the students, which is something really interesting. Um, to promote resilience, most investigations, what they do is that they communicate to the students, you can achieve something. You can, you can be great at this. You can actually achieve something for your life. This is really interesting because when we looked at what's going on in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in places uh, uh, with lower income or uh, less or working class neighborhoods, Um, the speech, the, the discourse of the teachers, actually, it's not built on that premise. Uh, you can uh, actually, this is something that Paul Willis, which is um, a British investigator, investigator, stated many years ago in a, in a really fascinating book called Why Do Working Class Kids Get Working Class Jobs? And what he showed us in that study is that teachers uh, were uh, promoting an idea, uh, an, uh, an expectation of life that it was really low. It was based basically on just do uh, or whatever your parents did. And uh, this is the, I mean, this is the most that you can achieve. There's nothing else that you can do re regarding of your condition. So 
Um, one thing that projects and uh, interventions in resilience actually do promote is a higher expectation of uh, of life for the for the student. And another aspect that they uh, promote is the um, a more broad and a more significant significant participation within the community. Uh, this is really important because the youth tends to be marginalized from the decision-making processes of society. And uh, in that sense, to actually improve the participation of the youth in this area um, has shown to be really, really productive in terms of promoting a more resilient environment for the, the students. Once again, when we look at the strategy uh, that the interventions actually use, we can see that they tend to develop skills, social skills, and um, they try to put it in the curriculum, I mean, which is basically the document that state the way that a school is going to teach uh, through uh, a, a long period of time. And finally, when we look at the results of the, the results of the of the of these interventions, we faced once again with the problem of contrast, construct measurement, and this happens because what we are actually doing is that we are developing social skills or changing the environment. We are not building resilience directly because once again we have no idea if. Resilience is actually an independent or a dependent variable. In that way, I'm leaning towards towards thinking that resilience is a result and is a social result. We promote, we can create resilient communities, communities, um, and that's something that we can achieve. Uh, but in that sense, it's still a result. It's not the cause of the phenomenon. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the post-pandemic scenario. The schools and the educational system in Latin America has been widely uh, impacted uh, by, by, by the coronavirus situation, the pandemic. Um, today, the OECD actually is, states that we should build different pedagogical um, models, more personalized, more flexible, that we should link in a better way uh, with the families, the employers, the community. Um, we should uh, actually, uh, th they say that we should uh, improve the working conditions of the teachers and to develop new abilities and, and new knowledge to endure with the changing environment. And this is really interesting and this is really important because what we are seeing right now, and uh, I'm pretty sure that you are seeing this in your country as well, is that an, an, a significant, significant number of teachers today have lost their jobs. A significant number of students are not able to connect with online classes. They don't have the resources. They don't have the access to this type of uh, of, of educational approach to to an online educational approach. Um, so, in that sense, we need to start discussing about how we can finance education in a different way. Most of the countries that uh, that today uh, that, that we looked through this study today uh, set uh, an important uh, important um, uh, aspect of the funding to private sector, and uh, this is okay. Well, I have no problems in in terms of the uh, private sector to actually uh, provide education or to support certain uh, educational um, assistance. However, <clears throat> it is necessary today that we build a, a, a state response to this in terms of uh, developing public policy and 
providing the access and source to people that can no longer continue to miss uh, classes, to miss uh, education just because they don't have access to internet. Um, we should start discussing about uh, stuff like universal minimum wage uh, to build a more strong and um, higher uh, taxes st structure for the rich And of course, we should start discussing discussing about the economical uh, implications and the economical sources of this pandemic. If we continue to build a society that is based on predatory practices uh, regarding the nature, uh, uh, it's really it's highly likely, it's highly probable that we will be facing different pandemics in the future. Uh, this is produced by our activity in the world and the way that we are <clears throat> understanding our relationship with nature. And this is something that we need to address right now because right now, actually, it is too late. Um, when we talk about resilience in that sense, we should understand that, uh, as, as I was saying, uh, when we start talking uh, today, uh, we should not understand resilience as Uh, as the capacity to accept what's going on with the system. Resilience has an utopian way of uh, actually being understood. And that's the, uh, that's the beauty of the concept because it allows us to think in a different future, to think in a different world uh, that we can build if we uh, take these challenges seriously. Um, that's con that concludes my 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 presentation. I'll I'll let you. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll listen to your questions, and I'll, I'll, uh, once again, I want to say thank you to Amarna, uh, to Ceres, uh, and especially to Estrella, Sara, and, and Liliana. Thank you, Diego, for your presentation and for um, I think giving us this overview um, around what resilience is. Um, I think I personally agree with a lot of what you're saying, uh, and especially the difference in the paradigms, paradigms that we discuss. And sometimes we usually do focus only in the individual paradigm and sometimes only on the environmental one. Um, and so I think my question would be, um, have you seen any innovative learning experiences that, in your opinion, have worked in addressing, um, you know, how they are either including resilience um, and or positive youth development. Um, and if you can tell us a bit about, you know, any any good um, innovative learning experience that you know of, that you've heard of, or that, you know, you come across in your um, research. Yes, uh, I'm going to talk about two uh, specific situations. Uh, one is the the projects based on uh, Uh, on the um, conflict in Colombia. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we all know that there there's has been a, a serious amount of problems in Colombia in terms of the guerrilla and, uh, the, and, the, and the paramilitares. And, uh, of course, uh, that's a really hard environment to, in, in which you have to provide education or you have to provide certain uh, social uh, support for people there. And there's some really interesting experience. I'm going to just briefly talk about the one that uh, Eugenia Acevedo and uh, Hugo Mondragón developed uh, probably 10 years ago. You can find this online and I can actually, uh, if, if you want to access this paper, I can send it to you. And I'm going to leave my email for that. And what they did is that they, they actually... Uh, Talk, work with the teachers, that it was something that we were seeing uh, a few minutes ago in, in this uh, conference, and um, they achieved two things that I think are really important, and the first one is to actually include these topics on the curricula of the institutions. Why is this important? That because if you're a teacher, one thing that you know is that if something is not on the curricula, it doesn't exist. So you have to put it, <laughs> that's actually a really strong political fight when when 
when you when you work with uh, in, uh, educational uh, institutions uh, directors you know that you have to convince them to put this in the curricula uh, so you can actually achieve results another situation that i think it's um, uh, this is not probably a, a good example but it's a situation that i would like to analyze because i think it's really uh, important to see how the environmental factors uh, contribute to 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 promoting or setting barriers for resilience and uh, i was uh, i had the opportunity uh, to work in ciudad de juarez um, for a brief amount of time i, I was there for a brief amount of, of time, but I was able to see one thing that we don't know or that we usually don't speak when we talk about the problem in Ciudad de Juarez. We all know the narcotic, uh, the traffic, the drug traffic situation. Uh, we all know that uh, many people have died because of that, but what we do not talk about is the fact that Ciudad de Juarez was a really small town uh, prior to the entering of uh, companies called maquilas. Maquilas are basically companies in which you uh, put together parts of vehicles in, in the case of uh, Ciudad de Juarez. And what, what I saw there was that um, the, wages, the wages that those companies were paying to people were uh, insufficient to overcome poverty. Why is this important? When we look, for instance, um, in Chile, a person that works in the lowest level of drug trafficking earns about a thousand, uh, a bit more dollars a month. When we look at the minimum wage in Chile, which is close to uh, $500, we can see clearly that working for drug trafficking uh, associations, it's more profitable. So if we do not provide a system that can actually compete with that amount of money, we are actually leaving uh, the youth uh, to, I mean, take the, the simplest decision and actually a decision that it's quite reasonable. If they are paying me more money in drug trafficking, why should I work for 10 years uh, if I'm not going to step out of poverty? Maybe I just should work for two years for drug trafficking and I will take my family and, and put it in a different situation. So, yes, we have to start intervene in terms of public policy, but of course, and also we should uh, improve um, what we are actually paying today to people in, in all Latin America. Precarious jobs today are a pandemic uh, in, our, uh, in our continent, and we should address that too. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. And I think you touch a very important point here that, um, and just like you mentioned, right, resilience is a social concept. And for me, this also includes the economic, the social and the environmental aspect of resilience that sometimes we only focus on, you know, my individual um, resilience towards my own, you know, obstacles through life. And, you know, and those could be, you know, more social and economic, but we're also talking around, you know, what's the environment like and how is it supporting the community to become more resilient or not? And um, I think it, it's really important that you just brought back that that last idea. Um, and, you know, since you have a lot of experience in learning, I wanted to ask you, what is for you transformative learning? We know that um, we... We are, as Sarah and you know, we are a lot, we are practitioners, and we do, you know, include um, learning and educational as part of our, you know, cross-cutting areas. Um, and we do include leadership, um, and in a way, we do say, okay, you know, how can we provide the competencies and the skills for youth, you know, to be prepared for what's coming. Um, and, but also to be transformational, to create change. And so what for you is that transformative learning? 
This is a really interesting question because when we look at the traditional educational system, it was uh, basically a teacher speaking to a crowd of students and that crowd of students saying yes and repeating itself, uh, what, repeating what the teacher was saying. That's the traditional and, and that's probably the, the educational setting in which we grow up. When we talk about transformative learning, we are actually stating that in order to learn, you have to change your environment. In order to achieve a better learning, you have to transform what's going on, uh, not only with yourself, but also with your community, your neighborhood, your family, your school. And why this is a, a paradigm that I, I really uh, liked in that sense is because uh, it puts you in action. It moves you through action. What Transformative learning, which is a theory, uh, which is a which is a theory built by um, Mesirov, um based on Habermas, and Paulo Freire, and so on. Um, what he's saying is that our belief system changes when we when we uh, are faced with reality, when we are faced with what's going on in our environment, and in order to learn. We should change that. We should build a better community. We should build a, build a better um, neighborhood. We should change our school. Maybe we should we can we can promote or we can create projects to actually make our school a better place to work, uh, a better place to learn. Um, and while we are doing this, while we are actively changing the environment, we are also changer, changing our belief system. Uh, to put it in another way, many, many of the professionals that work in social environments actually don't know what the social reality is. And the minute that they are put in a, in a, in a school room uh, with 40, 40, 45, 50 students, then they realize the difficulties that the teacher has to actually promote learning. And um, that, is a, that is an example of how profound, how deep can um, face, facing the reality actually change the way that you believe in something. Um, prior to that experience itself, you probably... Uh, had built different theories about why uh, the the student academic achievement was low. Maybe you were saying, uh, maybe you were thinking, maybe the, the the students are actually lazy. Maybe the teacher is not doing the right job. But the minute that you walk into that room filled with fifty students and you see the condition in which in which they are working, um, you realize that the challenge is other and your belief, belief system change. Um, I had that experience. I, I, I remember that we were working on a project in Jamaica, and what we wanted to do uh, with that consultancy project was to improve the, the, the organizational, um, the organizational uh, scheme, the, the organizational uh, work uh, that the institutions were doing. And the minute that we started talking to the organizations, the educational organizations, they, they, say, they said to us, well, that's really interesting, but what we actually need is clothed, clothing and shoes for our students. So um, yes, you have to, transformative learning is something that moves you to put your feet on the, uh, on, the, on the ground, put your feet and actually put your hands to work. And, and in that process, you learn what you should do, what you should not do, uh, what you believe in, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, and um, with our experience, just like you mentioned, Diego, is we do a lot of experiential learning and, and that's just part of it, right? Instead of, you know, memorizing <laughs> a lot of the content, Oh, okay. I thought I thought I lost you. Instead of memorizing a lot of the content and concepts that we usually get in traditional learning, now you're starting to okay, like how do I, you know, inquiry more about this? Like, oh, 
should I just accept this con concept as it is, or should I, you know, discuss it a bit more in, in terms of like, you know, what are the different pers perspectives of looking at it? Um, and once you put that into practice, of course, we, we do also agree that um, transformative learning for us is taking it into action. And that's why when we see more young um, leaders create movements, create community plans, start taking action, start addressing issues that they are the ones concerned about them. That's where, you know, change and for us in, in the case starts, you know, changing culture, systems and societies, right? And in a way, of course, creating greater resilience for their community, their surroundings and themselves. So I think you, you've just pinpoint a lot and, um, so how can um, we go back? And so how can people um, that are not usually in the you know learning sphere um, link transformative learning within their communities, their families, or their you know students, either from private or public systems? Um, you know what can they do to link that transformative learning into you know their surroundings as well? Um, do that has to be by social programs? What other you know? Um, examples you've seen of, you know, successful examples of people linking transformative learning into their surroundings, um, especially in the educational systems. I think that one key aspect of that is to link the to open the schools, to open the institution, uh, educational institutions to their environment, um, to actually, I mean, it's hard right now because we're facing a, a, a pandemic and schools are closed uh, in most cases. And, and of course, if, 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 if it, it's hard to actually let the students to walk in school, it is harder to let the families, the community in the school. But uh, nevertheless, uh, all the experiences that I saw that are successful, successful in terms of uh, implementing transformative experiences are deeply practical are uh, deeply uh, apply apply it um, they they tend to uh, they actually what they do is that they organize themselves with the community to solve a certain issue uh, and they learn in the way different they, they try a first strategy sometimes that doesn't work then they try another one um, in that sense, we need a communitarian approach. Uh, I don't know if that's a word. I'm just going to use it. Uh, but we need to, I mean, what, what I'm saying with that is that um, we need to break the barriers of the institutions. We need to break limits of the, the institutions. Um, a school is not only the place, the building where it's it. It's built. A school is an, an environment, and that environment actually relates itself with the uh, neighborhood around it, the companies and factories that may be close to it, the the basketball courts or the football courts uh, that are uh, around them. Um, we need to open our schools in that sense to a wider community. Um, not the community is not the people who uses the school is that people, but also the people that lives around the school um, and uh, trans successful transformative experiences tend to have this wider abroad, uh, this wider uh, view uh, of the, of the relationship with the community. We should build more local uh, networks, uh, which is something that happens with the economical system that we live in, is that we lose connection with others. And we need to regain that. That's the only way to actually achieve transformative learning, if, if, if you want to know my opinion on that matter. Yeah, networks for me is critical in building connections, stronger relationships, um, and it's just the way for you know, in a way, leaders that are wanting to create change, youth leaders that are, you know, trying to sustain change need that system of support and networks me. It's and, and, and that, you know, the surrounding communities, the people that live next to us, the neighborhood, um, they are a very important part of, you know, building those right networks of support. 
Um, and I know that I'm um, about to be running out of time, and this will be my last question. Just as you mentioned that, of course, we are facing challenges um, in the educational system um, after a pandemic period. Can you and, and you mentioned a couple of things that we could do, like increase the minimum wage um, and also, you know, uh, tax structures for, you know, more wealthy people um, and sort of understand what are some of the economic implications also for the educational system. Are there anything that you would recommend that we could do um, for some of those challenges that we're going to be facing um, after a pandemic period that we are facing, but, that, you know, that are also coming that you could, um, you know, suggest things that we could have the, in mind? Yeah, the, the biggest challenge today is that a huge amount of people are not receiving education right now. Uh, and that's something that's urgent. That's something that's going on right now. That's something that we are seeing on a daily basis. Uh, so that's something that we should start changing now. And we are, we are actually behind uh, that, the solutions for that. Uh, uh, we are seeing uh, Chile is a country, and I'm going to talk about Chile because it's, it's, I'm Chilean and this is where I live. We uh, we tend to believe that our country was like the top of the top of Latin America, you know, like we are the best uh, country in education, we are the best country in social support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pandemic show us, uh, pandemic the, the pandemic scenario show 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 us the Chileans that our society is built on really weak uh, buildings, really weak uh, premises. And it shows us that we are left, we are, we are letting people miss the opportunity to gain access to education um, and the responses to actually change that have been really, really uh, poor in that sense. We need to address the fact that many, many, many kids, many youth, uh, many of the youth today are not getting a proper education. And uh, we need to do that by building. I have no problem with public and private sector uh, alliances for building for solving that right now. Uh, we need answers and solutions from all the sector sector from all the the the, uh, the the sectors of society to solve that problem right now. Because what we are going to if we don't provide education today, what we're going to see tomorrow is kids and, and the youth working to uh, provide for their families when they should be studying. So well, if we don't address that now, we're creating a problem for the future that is going to be huge in terms of, um, in terms of uh, consequences for, the, for that youth and for the society itself. Yes, we need to start now, just like you said. And if there's anything that we can do is, of course, bring education um, as a priority into our surroundings, into our conversation and, you know, with our our neighborhoods. Is there anything that we can do as educators, um, we, you know, is, you know, share that education towards the people that are not receiving it right now? Um, so, of course, we're going to... Um, Thank you, Diego, for your time today, um, for sharing your thoughts, your um, experience and your research about, um, you know, the things that you've been doing in terms of transformative learning, but also um, around resilience and positive youth development. You have just given us a lot of information to process, to sort of go back and say, you know, how, how what's my paradigm around resilience? And so I think it's It was very valuable. Thank you for your time. I'm not just sure if you want to, you know, have uh, any any other final comments. Um, but this is going to be a wrap for today.
<laughs> Great. I just want to say thank you once again to Amarna, to Ceres, and, and everyone at, at their teams. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about these issues and, and to share experiences. And I'm looking forward to continue to doing this with, with you and with everyone who, who actually wants to, to change the situations that are affecting people right now. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And have a good day, everyone. Good afternoon and good day. Bye-bye.